thanks, thanks so much, and I'm honored that Travis Rampton would say a, a kindred spirit. Uh, I was just so taken by the whole conversation and kept thinking, wow, I wish I was as smart as that guy. And as tall. Uh, <laughs> neither of which will come to pass. Well, uh, this is a conversation about taking God seriously. It's about peacemaking, specifically about peacemaking with Muslims. And in that sense, I would also say it's also about justice. And part of justice is strong people looking out for weak people. That's a very important thing. And to take that seriously, informed by the character of God, I think is a very important thing to reflect on. And I realize I'm speaking to very key opinion leaders who will go out. You're already in the world. And over the next many years, you'll go out into the world speaking to people regularly and teaching people. And I would just encourage you to focus on the character of God and take Him seriously and to take serious the call to be peacemakers. That is an ancient call that is fresh and new every day for us. It's also about sustainability in the sense of making sure that what we do in the humanitarian world isn't a quick fix. It's not just throwing money. It's something which is a really good thing because Global Samaritan has no money. <laughs> so, so really don't have to worry about that. But about providing resources to people that, that have a plan that's long term. It's about taking action instead of waiting on politicians or governments or military. But there's something that we can do. It's about instead of doing nothing, doing something and, and doing something significant. And I think this is a really important reflection. It's about Christians sending hope directly into hell. We see these headlines and we're rightly frustrated and angered and indignant and helpless all at the same time. What in the world can we do? These little girls lost their family in Kamishli, Syria a town that had been long protected by the Kurdish Peshmerga and ISIS had never detonated a car bomb or had a massive attack in that community till a few weeks ago. When I was in Iraq this summer, I was told explicitly that the children in Syria and even southern Iraq, it's, it's a normal thing to consider that they are born into hell, they live their life in hell, they die in hell. And the plea of these little girls to me just says, please help. And so this is a conversation about sending hope. You're familiar, and I'm going to move very fast. Feel free to interrupt me at any time. My goal is to finish a bunch of pictures in about 20 minutes and then just have a conversation with a little bit of time we might have left in questions and answers. So you're familiar that the northern part of Iraq is commonly referred to as Kurdistan. The Kurds live in Iran and the breakaway republics from the old Soviet empire, the other stands north of Iran and Iraq. The Kurds live in Turkey and Syria. And we just need to acknowledge that the Sunni-Shia conflict within Islam is something that we're not going to fix. We didn't create that conflict. And, and my point is not to get into the weeds of that conflict. I wouldn't be really adequate trying to anyway. I, I don't know all the dynamics of their conflict, but it has been brewing for a long time, and it was not caused by any current or recent U.S. president and won't be fixed by U.S. policy. ISIS occupies much of northern Iraq and much of Syria. Mosul is located right here. If I back up a slide, you can see it. That is the ancient biblical city of Nineveh. And of course, you know it's very much in the news. This is the Tigris River, very much in the news today because of the offensive going into Mosul to push ISIS out. You can fly commercial into Erbil. And if you're watching the news, you're seeing a lot of news reports from Erbil right now. That's where I flew into on a commercial airliner. We drove up to Duho, which ought to be a four-hour drive, but it was a two-hour drive because our driver, named Hooner Asker, 
drives so fast and so crazy. People ask me, were you ever afraid for your life when you were in Iraq? And my answer is yes. Every time Hunter Asker got behind the wheel. And I asked, what does the name Hunter Asker mean in Kurdish? They said, well, translated into English, it's Mario Andretti. I said, I believe that. <laughs> If there was any danger, it's when we went down to Sinjar, and you'll remember the Sinjar province on top of Sinjar Mountain. 20,000 Yazidis two years ago were trapped by ISIS. We spent the night on that mountain with the Sinjar city on the south side of the mountain. You'll go to Sinjar city in a moment, and I'll show you the mountain. The Peshmerga hold this line. The Peshmerga are the Kurdish fighting force. They're involved in the push to Mosul. They are largely a defensive force, and the reason you can fly into Erbil, and the reason there's no car bombs in Erbil, the reason you can safely drive to Duhok, unless Hooner's driving, and the reason you can sneak down to Sinjar is because the Peshmerga hold that line. Peshmerga is a Kurdish word, a combination of two Kurdish words. It literally means stand in the way of death. And there I am with two Peshmerga at the front with ISIS. And we'll talk about that in the Sinjar province. So what we're doing is we're sending fortify dehydrated food packs into Erbil. It's delivered through our partner, the Barzani Charity Foundation, directly to the refugees. Each one of these packs has six servings of food, and each serving of food has all the nutrients needed for one person for one day. Now, that, that people often ask, does that mean then that it's everything you need? Well, it doesn't mean you won't be hungry, but it does mean you'll have all the vitamins and nutrients that the average person needs for one day. So far, we've sent 2 million plus servings of food. We have 6 million more on the way soon. We send it through the U.S. Air Force. And we acquire the food for free from U.S. food providers who are incentivized by the U.S. federal government to donate food for tax credit. There's quite a bit of paperwork to be done and quite a scrutiny process to determine who gets that food because you can imagine a million servings of food is worth anywhere from three hundred thousand to four hundred thousand dollars wholesale so who gets that food well they give it to brokers and the brokers have to decide who to give it to and in fact early on they wouldn't even think about letting us into iraq because they just knew it would get stolen by isis or get pirated by corrupt people in the central Iraqi government. So we've actually bought $50,000 worth of food with the, with the help of some folks out in Midland and sent that and then proved to them the, the distribution chain. So we acquire the food for free. We ship it for free to the U.S. Air Force. So the only cost is moving the food domestically. And we're raising money to do that. Here I am at the U.S. Air Force facility in Erbil. It's, it's hard to talk about these things without bumping into politics and policy. I'm not a politician. I'm not an expert in policy. But trust me, when U.S. politicians say, you know, I'm against sending troops into Iraq, we have 5,000, over 5,000 troops there, and there are 2,000 troops at this Air Force facility. And it's all semantics. They'll say, well, we no longer have any air bases in Iraq. That's true. But we do have an Air Force facility with 2,000 men and women working for the U.S. Air Force. Actually, these two guys work for the U.S. Army. Now, this is Eskender Sela of the Barzani Charity Foundation, our direct partner. I went to meet Eskender and his team to understand what they do, how they do it, why they do it. They are Kurdish people working cooperatively with Muslims, Jews, Christians, and Yazidis, agnostics and atheists, with a simple mission to help people. That's it. So as Christians, we said we're eager to join you. We think we have an important role to play. Since they've asked us for an overwhelming number of servings of food, they've asked for 250 million over the next 12 months. And that's because the need is so great. So how do we do this? Well, we send it, and these guys are the guys in charge of the food once it lands. And this is Alan Cooper. He's a sergeant in the U.S. Army. Remember him. Remember his face. See him? He's not a theologian. He's not a pastor. He's a U.S. Army sergeant. Remember him. So I went and saw the warehouse where the food is taken. And in our stack of boxes, all this food is provided by the Kurdish people. In our stack of boxes, I found one from Midland that a child had drawn on. 
Sergeant Alan Cooper told me, he said, this is the most important thing going on in the war on terror today. And I said, can you explain that a little bit? What are you talking about? He says, well, imagine the power of a little Christian child sending a box of food to a hungry, marginalized, at-risk, deeply wounded Muslim child. And on the box, they've got friendship, beautiful friends, sunshine, love, hope, and balloons. He said, there's nothing more important in the war on terror today. Go back to America and tell people, keep sending boxes of food that kids have drawn on. Blew me away. And then I said, so Alan, how many non-government organizations like Global Surrender Resources are doing this? He said, doing what? I said, sending food to Erbil. He said, you guys in Texas are the only ones. So here we are in Abilene, home to an Air Force base and three Christian universities. This is our time and our opportunity to do something simple, incredibly simple and incredibly significant. Sergeant Cooper told me, he said, we don't have enough bombs and bullets. There are churches in our build. This is Pastor Gassan. Had a wonderful long visit with him and understood that basically those of you that preach are going to preach, you might want to copy Pastor Gasson's sermon. He preaches it every Sunday. He said, I preach forgiveness. And I preach justice. And I preach mercy. This is a line of men and boys in the desert. Kurdistan is beautiful with a lot of rolling mountains, but it's also a flat desert plain as well. It was 116 degrees in the heat at this food distribution spot. Not everybody goes to a refugee camp. So these are people that are receiving food for their families because they're not in a camp. And I could have stayed there for weeks taking photographs, particularly of the children. I took two pictures of these little girls. You would think I hired little Muslim models and went into a studio and got the lighting right, you know. Two pictures, this is one of them. And the other one is just as beautiful. Their mother gave me permission. She wants their daughter's fa her daughter's faces to be seen. She wants the world to know. This little boy lives in a camp with 7,000 other Syrians. We went inside their home, had hot tea. It was about 9 o'clock at night, 96 degrees there. And look how he's dressed. These are not indigent poor people because they're not industrious and they're not hard working. These are indigent poor people and refugees because ISIS has obliterated their homes and overrun their families. Now I can't say for certain, but the odds are this little guy's dad or uncle or maybe older brothers have been killed or stolen away by ISIS. He probably has very much at risk older siblings or cousins or aunts ISIS currently has over 5,000 women in sex slavery behind ISIS held territory in Syria and Iraq. We're involved with a group you'll meet in a moment in a photograph helping rescue Yazidi women that are trapped by ISIS. This little girl stands to me as an image of the reformation that Islam is going through. The young girl in the western dress with the backdrop of the older conservative Muslim women in their burqas. Now, the older conservative women are there in a food distribution line because ISIS has killed their families, too. You can take the Yazidis and the Christians and the Jews, add up all of them that ISIS kills, multiply by 10, and still not be at the number of Muslims that ISIS kills. This old couple is living in Sarsing, Iraq, in a community of 200 displaced, persecuted Christians from Mosul. They still have relatives in Mosul. I have him on video talking in Arabic being translated into English about how he longs to go home. A little Muslim child drew a dove over a heart undergirded by olive branches with the Jews, the Yazidis, the Astrocenarian religion of the Yazidi people. 
the Muslims and the Christians all together populating the heart. And it didn't take me long to figure out if we could just get these kids together. And this is our hope. This is it. And so in addition to children, I'm highly interested in getting the three universities in Abilene to start a movement where college students get involved and just start writing messages of friendship and hope on boxes for little Muslim kids. And we'll send the food over. It's like planting a shade tree. You do it for your kids or your grandkids. We have an opportunity now to minister to children who will grow up and be making decisions. And what kind of decisions will they make? Well, I don't know, but they will be informed by the thoughts and the feelings they have about you and me and the decisions we make. This Yazidi man is a Peshmerga soldier who was so eager to have his photograph taken. They are hardworking people who get paid almost nothing, and they're the ones standing in the way of death. This is the city of Sinjar, a city the size of Abilene population-wise, and probably the size of Abilene in terms of every demographic, totally destroyed and devastated by ISIS and then the retaking of Sinjar by Allied troops in the Peshmerga last fall. While we were there, we still couldn't step just anywhere due to fear uh, of, of, of landmines. There was mustard gas in the air and our eyes were burning and they apologized for two days earlier ISIS had gassed this region. And this is Sinjar Mountain. The old city of Sinjar sits at the base of it. ISIS even takes the heads off of children's toys. This is where ISIS committed genocide against the Yazidi people. You're going to see a video in just a moment that will conclude us of this cross. And we replaced it at the doorway of this old church in Sinjar. There are mass graves in Sinjar. The most recent one they estimate to have 9,500 bodies in it. This is the rapid response force of the Peshmerga army. And there, my friends, is Mario Andretti, <laughs> the man, the legend, Hunter <laughs> Asker. And there's Eskender. This is Monty Montgomery, a great friend of mine, a dear Christian brother. We belong to a house church together, and he went with me to Iraq. This is General Akira Amidi, a legend among Peshmerga. And this is his crew, and this man in the Red Beret is David Schumach, an American that's volunteering. He gets no pay, so technically he's not really a mercenary. He's there giving advice and counsel. I get messages from David almost daily still. He's right now on the way to Mosul with the Peshmerga. He's pointing out the ISIS line, which is 500 meters away behind a berm that maybe you can see here. And after a long evening and dinner and much conversation, we talked about the scriptures, and David pulled out his Bible. In John, I'm sorry, James chapter 4, verse 14. What is your life? It is a vapor that appears for a short while and then vanishes. A verse that means so much to him because his daughter had pointed it out to him when their pastor was preaching on that verse, and she leaned over and wrote the word life and underlined it. He said she put her arm around him and leaned over and kissed him and said, Daddy, this is the most important thing for us to keep things in perspective, to trust God, to know life. He said three days later, his daughter was killed by a drunk driver. And he went back and he highlighted it and he wrote in the margin, Sissy's last verse before she died and she smiled at me. He tells me this story, this Rambo of a man. I call him one part Rambo, one part John Wayne, one part Mother Teresa, one part T.D. Jakes. And he begins to cry and he begins to say what's most important. And I noticed 
Actually, a lady in a presentation here in Abilene noticed verse 17, and I blew it up, and it says, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. So this is our challenge. That night we went back to Sinjar Mountain, escorted by two trucks, one in front and one behind, with guys and machine guns. And on, home, on the way home the next day to Erbil to fly home, Eskander said, Hey, we're crossing the Tigris River. Abraham would have walked up. Abraham, Jonah went to Iraq. Abraham was called from Iraq. God has always had a heart for these people. And remember God's call to Abraham so that he would be a blessing to all nations. You language experts know that it's ethnos. It's everybody. Abraham would have walked up this valley, scholars think, and crossed the Tigris and the Sinjar Valley. In fact, those of you that have been to Israel will appreciate this. He crossed on this very bridge. Not really, but that's what they tell you in Israel about all these holy sites, right? <laughs> so let me just quickly answer a couple of questions about how we do it. We access the food for free. And so we, we just are asking five grand for a load of food because that helps cover all of our domestic costs. It can be a thousand, I'm sorry, a million servings of protein-rich soup that costs out to 0 0.005 cents a serving, or it can be 285,000 servings of fortified rice that prices out to 0 0.0175 cents a serving. So this is something that we're seeing more and more people jump on board and get involved in. They're starting to give us monthly smaller amounts because it grows exponentially. Ten bucks a month is 120 bucks a year, and look at this. This was the conversation that I've had with some of, some of the Hart and Simmons undergrad and some ACU folks as well about trying to get 10% of the student bodies of McMurray, Hart and Simmons, and ACU to get involved and to, for, for college students to give what they pay for Netflix. That's the price point. I didn't come up with that. Some college students did. Look at this. One college student giving 10 bucks a month, but what if 1,000 students do it? This is far more powerful than one person giving us ten thousand a month or one hundred twenty thousand a year. Far more powerful because the conversations grow exponentially. It's really incredible. But beyond that, instead of that, we genuinely believe that God will figure out all of what we have no clue about, which is really a, a great theological point, isn't it? You know, if you're just dumb enough to say yes to God, he'll figure out the details, right? Can I get an amen? I thought of that many times when I was in Iraq. Trust me. If you're dumb enough to say yes to God, you never know where you'll be. We'll bring an entire load of boxes here and let your students and let you write messages on it for the kids. We'll conclude with this very brief overview of something I think really significant that happened in Sinjar. Muslim and 
mothers, a Yazidi, was there helping us as well. Eskender describes himself as agnostic. I said, why do you describe yourself that way? He says, well, I'm not Muslim because Muslims love to fight, and I'm not Christians because Christians love to argue. He says, so I call myself agnostic because I'm a man of peace and I just want to help people. And I said, oh, okay, then I'm agnostic too. He said, I don't know you know it, but you just described the essence of the Christian faith. Jesus said the peacemakers will be called. You all know what Jesus said? The peacemakers will be called? Yeah, agnostics. The children of God. So I like to say the cross was returned to the doorway by Yazidis, Muslims, Christians, and one guy who's got it right. He just doesn't know he does. Let me conclude by saying that I think that James Simmons would say this is a good thing. Looking out for marginalized people, standing up to injustice, doing the right thing when it's not always the popular thing, doing something so profound yet so simple. I mean, this is, this is a very important conversation. So that's it, and I'm happy to entertain questions, and you may have some specific questions about how we do what. I'm happy to answer anything that I know, and if I don't know the answer, trust me, I'm happy to say I got no clue. Questions? Anybody? If we want to uh, decorate one of those boxes, say with our kids, can we yeah. just come to the facility there on North First? Or? Well, you could. What I'd really prefer, you, well, yes, the answer okay. is yes, you could. What I'd really prefer is somebody take this to your churches and to this university and grow it exponentially because if you come to us that's fantastic and you're always welcome but that's one individual with one family and some children we can grow it and it can spread like fire through dry stubble if we do it with the opportunity for hundreds to be involved so i don't know how to do that and i don't know the right opinion leaders to make that happen but you may and you can help me figure that out and in the meantime, the answer is yes, you can come. We don't always have boxes available relative to the government's inspection for shipping. So you can contact me at Global Center and Resources. You can find my email, get it from Dr. Frampton. Uh, find me uh, at the Dixie Pig, where I like to go eat breakfast, wherever, wherever you can find me. Um, in my fantasy football chat page, you know, the places I frequent, Starbucks. And we can have a conversation and I can set you up. Yes. How many of those boxes would come in case here to sign? We got that. One one pallet has about thirty-five or thirty-six boxes on it. One entire load consists of about thirty-six pallets. So there's a lot of ways to do that. Um, if if the university said we'd like to do an entire load. 285,000 servings of food and get our hands on it and write on every box. That would be incredible. And what we would do is plan that, provide all of the logistics logistics, and have it sent directly here first so it wouldn't even go to our warehouse first. It would come here first. And then we just have to have a covenant where it's safeguarded and the students do it fairly efficiently and quickly so that it gets to our warehouse. It's shrink-wrapped again and then made available for inspection by the U.S. federal government. The little load you saw where it said, be happy on the one box, a little church in Haskell, Texas did that. They took 20 boxes. And, you know, Haskell is an hour north of here, and it's in the country where, you know, they, they just figure stuff out, you know, everything, you know. I was talking to some pastors at the Gateway Church in Southlake, wonderful people, one of the, one of the nation's largest churches. In South Lake, a lot of people drive big trucks four-wheel drive, but the tires have never left the pavement. And it was so funny talking to them. They said, well, how would we get boxes over here? And I said, it's very difficult. You drive over to Abilene, and we load them in your truck. And they said, really? I said, yes. Yes, those trucks you drive, you can put stuff in the back of them. <laughs> wow, this is incredible. It's incredible. 
So one pickup truck holds about 20 boxes. That's another way to look at it. There yet is, there's no group yet who said, we want to do an entire load. I'd love to see Art and Sims be the first, but that can be overwhelming. You're talking about a whole lot of boxes. Yes, sir. If, if one student in this room would take the initiative organize the students, like the school theology, take a truck load. That's awesome. You mean like a big load? Big load. It's incredible. It's incredible. <coughs> I'm sorry? Say it louder. If one student out of this room could take the initiative to organize and help pull together the students at Lodge the School of Theology and Seminary, Lodge the School of Theology would take a truck load of those boxes and have signed and have our students on campus do this. I really am the worst fundraiser in the world because I really it's not that I don't care I'm just not worried about it I probably ought to be more worried about it. my board always says you need to be more worried about this <clears throat> I'm not looking for one person to write a ten thousand dollar check I really am not that little church in Haskell Texas I didn't ask them for a dime their deacons met that next oh well, that same afternoon they called me I preached up there on a Sunday and they said, well, our church decided to give me $10,000. And I was just blowing me 120 people. I said, are you kidding me? And then two sisters in the church called me the next day, totally separate from what the church was doing, and they gave another 10000 I said, are you sure? And I was you know, like trying to talk them out of it. They said, no, 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 we want to do this. So I've learned, don't ask for money. I need somebody here to figure out that piece where a goal that's reasonable could be set in 10% of the student body can get involved by giving recurring small gifts. You saw how it grows exponentially. It's incredible. Other questions or anything? We have the student volunteers. So Here we go. We'll be in touch. Perfect. Perfect. I'll make sure that Travis has a bunch of my business cards as well. Yes, sir. You plan to go back to the region? I'm so glad you asked that. Uh, March of 2017, I'm going back and I'm taking three or four pastors with me to go to the front with ISIS. It won't, not, it won't by then be in the Sinjar province. It'll probably be Mosul or south of Mosul, but we're going to go back to the front with ISIS to the Rapid Response Force and pray with them. One of the reasons we're going to go back and do that is we've got some historians looking at this. There is right now no known record, and if you find one, please let me know. The last thing we want to do is false advertising. No known record of any conflict between Christians and Muslims going back to the Crusades where a group of Christians went specifically to the front lines with nothing else but prayer. There's no record of that. So we'd like to do that. We think that's an important thing. It's more than symbolism. We think it's real substantive. When I left, about two weeks after I got back, they told me that General Lacar had sent a message out to 2,500 of the Peshmerga troops with my name asking them, in fact, not just asking, he commanded on this general, if you can imagine this, he commanded all the Muslims, the Yazidis, and the Christian Peshmerga to pray for Danny Sims and the Christians in the U.S. helping them. And I got that message and I just wept. And I felt a burden in this. So we're going to go back and we're going to pray for them and with them at the front with ISIS. And if it's in Syria, we'll go to Syria. We're sending toys. There's a guy called the Toy Smuggler of Aleppo that's getting toys into Syria, into Aleppo for children. There are still 275,000 people in Aleppo, and they're all trapped by ISIS. We don't know how many ISIS people there are. There's tens of thousands for sure, but the residents of Aleppo are devastated. If you've seen the Netflix documentary, White Helmets, you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't seen it, you need to, and I'll make this quick. But that guy is getting toys to children and so we're also going to begin an initiative where we're collecting stuffed animals to send on the next load over, and they will go to Duhok, and then they will be ferried into Syria directly to the toy smuggler of Aleppo. And we're going to join that effort, bringing some kind of hope to children. Time for one more question. Thanks, Danny Sims, for his presentation and for sharing with us today.